Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless approximately 200 north americans arrived in israel and aliyah setting a new record for single day immigration this despite ongoing conflict and threats with a total of 600 newcomers expected this week some 200 north americans made aliyah today arriving in israel on five different flights a new record that kicks off an extraordinary week of immigration. Organized by Nefesh Benefesh in collaboration with Israel's Ministry of Aliyah and Integration, the Jewish Agency, Karen Kayemet Israel, and JNF USA, this marks the largest single day arrival of new immigrants this year. Throughout the week, from August 20 to 28, a total of 600 newcomers will settle in Israel on 14 group Aliyah flights provided by Nefesh Benefesh. This latest wave is part of a broader trend, with 2,000 olim from infants as young as two months to elders aged 97, making the move to Israel this summer. The most important time to show solidarity with the Jewish people, in the middle of a war. We have to come, be part of the Jewish people, do our part. It's great to be in the country of Israel where everybody's, you know, following and doing things that, you know, the Jewish, Jewish nation and the Jewish people have, you know, studied and learned to do for generations and now we have the opportunity to you know live the dream and do it in israel like we're supposed to so why why live anywhere else the jewish agency told ILTV tv that nearly 20,000 new immigrants arrived in israel between january and july 2024 between october 7th and the beginning of the summer influx of immigrants more than 2,500 olim from the u.s and canada alone have made aliyah with many settling in central cities like jerusalem tel aviv and modin nefesh benefesh said that half of these new arrivals cite zionism as their main reason for moving to israel this is where the jewish people are supposed to be this year stands out as new immigrants arrive amid more than 10 months of ongoing conflict, with 109 Israelis still held captive and the looming threat of escalation from Iran. This challenge, Aliyah and Integration Minister Ofer Sofer emphasized, is precisely why Israel needs more Olim. I think that it's a strength in us. It's give us a power. It's give us a resilience. Uh, it's amazing. I think what uh, our enemies think about us when they say Jews coming to Israel, Israel and continue coming here to Israel, this is, the, uh, this is our response, this is our answer for uh, their attacks. Nefesh Benefesh has been helping North Americans make Aliyah for over 20 years. Yet each time a plane touches down, the organization's founders say it is just as exciting as ever. It's very hard not to be inspired, especially during the times of, of what we're living through now and to see that nothing deters a Jew from coming home. They're fulfilling a dream and will help them. What's wrong with that? And each individual is in each individual, from the little baby to the elderly person. They're all fulfilling their dream of coming home to Israel. So we can't be excited. We have to be excited. We, we just love it. Why not? They're the good news. That's the good news for today. So this morning when people wake up in Israel, this is the good news that you're going to see. No one's running away from anything. They're running to something. And, and they're here to help. They feel that they're coming to Israel. They're gonna fulfill their dream. I keep saying that, but it's true. But they're gonna feel good about what they're doing, but they're also gonna be helping the country. They're doctors, lawyers, engineers, students, you know, soldiers. They're the integral part of the country. All these Olim are. So my, there's no encouragement needed. This is your country, come home. Isaiah 43, one, five and six. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Ever since the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, the Jewish people have been scattered all over the earth. One of the many signs we are living in the last days 
as the Jewish people would return to the land of Israel. This prophecy was fulfilled in the late 1900s and is still being fulfilled today. Hosea 3.5 Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18 through 20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Sentenced to nearly five years in prison for a nonviolent protest. That's what happened to a woman who sat down in front of the doors of an abortion clinic. Pro-life groups say her case is a prime example of how the Biden's Justice Department is unfairly prosecuting them. One long-standing symbol of the abortion battle happens outside in the form of protests. Since the end of Roe v. Wade, Americans are also hearing more about the federal law protecting clinics. The FACE Act stands for Freedom of Access to, clinics, to Clinic Entrances Act. It was instituted in 1994 under uh, the Clinton administration. And if you go to the DOJ's website, its stated purpose is to protect access to reproductive health, which is a euphemism for abortion. The law protects churches and clinics, including pro-life pregnancy centers, although critics clearly see its enforcement as one-sided. What pro-life, pro-lifers and conservatives have long claimed is that actually this act is really just a cudgel that's being used to target pro-life activists. And for the longest time, we didn't have the data to really substantiate that, uh, and now we do. Attorney Aaron Hawley with the Alliance Defending Freedom calls new data unearthed at the Justice Department troubling. After the fall of Roe, there's no question that FACE Act prosecutions, FACE Act investigations have ramped up exponentially. In 2022 alone, there were over 20 prosecutions of pro-life individuals. At the same time, records show a different approach towards dozens of arson cases at various churches and pregnancy centers. We see very few prosecutions at those sorts of individuals who are targeting pro-life facilities. Uh, rather, the, the vast majority of them uh, are, are targeting pro-life individuals uh, who are protesting or praying at abortion centers. Van Natta says DOJ data on FACE Act violations between 1994 and 2024 is jarring. There are approximately 211 cases and around 97 percent of those cases were targeted at pro-life or anti-abortion activists. She points to a specific increase in prosecutions under the Biden administration. The Biden's DOJ is responsible for over a quarter of all uh, FACE Act prosecutions in the law's 30 30-year history, which is pretty significant, uh, and he's also responsible for about 24% of the cases targeting pro-life activists. Martin Cannon at the Thomas More Society sees the same pattern. What, what has changed is the frequency of the prosecutions and also a tactic that the DOJ used. Uh, let's talk about frequency first. Uh, I've been doing this for 35 years. I've handled a couple of face cases over the years, uh, and, you know, maybe two and over 30 years. I've done about four in the last five years or, or so. Um, the Biden administration literally pulled out all the stops. When reached by CBN News, the Justice Department did not respond to specific questions about the data. I think about just one individual, Lauren Handy. I believe her sentence was 57 months. That's over four years, um, plus three years of supervised release. That's an awful long time for a nonviolent uh, sort uh, uh, of protest. Cannon represents Handy and argues she didn't even violate the FACE Act. She went into the clinic with her 
nine cohorts, two, maybe three of them blocked doors, very peacefully, but blocked doors. The other seven or eight simply sat in chairs, singing, praying, uh, handing out some pamphlets and things. There is no decent argument to be made that this was a face violation. These attorneys and others see a troubling pattern of heavy handedness that's resulted in unfair sentencing. Now, <laughs> under Biden's DOJ, you have elderly women who are being sentenced to two years in prison for peacefully praying in an abortion clinic, not making violent threats, not certainly not making bomb threats. So, the sentencing is wildly disproportionate. The Thomas More Society is appealing Handy's case and seeking to challenge the constitutionality of the FACE Act. Well, I hope the Justice Department wakes up to what they're doing because what they're doing is to destroying the concept of justice within American society. When you have unequal enforcement of a particular law where only one group is targeted and targeted because of ideology, well, then you draw into question all of your prosecutions. And is this based on ideology or is this based on the law? We have certainly seen since uh, the Dobbs decision uh, an increase of attacks on pri crisis pregnancy centers. At the same time, we haven't seen a single conviction for any of that. So they're being firebombed. Uh, they're being uh, defaced, it, it, they're having to hire security. All of this is happening under the same Justice Department, but we're seeing no investigations uh, that are leading to convictions. So if you have unequal enforcement, then everyone starts to now question, what in the world are you doing? Then when you add to it that you're going to have SWAT teams up, up here at the uh, pre-dawn raids uh, to arrest pro-lifers in their home in front of their children with full automatic weapons. Brothers and sisters, persecution is here. Believers in Jesus Christ believe in the authority of the Bible. We believe homosexuality is a sin and marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe in the sanctity of life and that abortion is murder and is a sin. We believe God created us male and female, and it is a sin to identify as a transgender. We believe Jesus is the only way to heaven, and that believing in any other way will send a person to hell. Get yourself spiritually prepared, because true Christians will be persecuted like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right, and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is, that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. The world will persecute true Christians and scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times would deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things. Fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is here. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. And some stunning images coming out of Iceland, where a volcano has erupted in spectacular style for the sixth time since December. The volcano began erupting Thursday night following a series of strong earthquakes. Let me just start by saying those visuals are simply mind-blowing. Akshay, it is incredible. It is striking. It is breathtaking seeing this volcano in southwestern Iceland back at it again, putting on this display, this striking display of Earth's power. These visuals truly yeah. are apocalyptic, right? Dark skies, <laughs> yeah. orange fire, and orange <laughs> as well in the skies. Truly apocalyptic. There has been a dramatic increase in volcanic eruptions around the world, and nobody knows why. 
You probably haven't noticed because nobody seems to be talking about it, but something is going on with the world. Volcanoes are erupting at a faster pace than ever, and earthquakes are going crazy, and nobody has an explanation for it. Nobody except God, that is. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world and the news headlines prove it. God in his grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, last day's signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation seems to include a massive volcanic eruption, as we read in Revelation 8.8. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. The risk of a dangerous virus spread by mosquitoes has four towns west of Boston, Massachusetts, urging residents to stay indoors after dark until at least October. Oxford, Massachusetts and three neighboring towns have a reason for concern as mosquitoes carrying a potentially deadly virus called Eastern Equine Encephalitis or Triple E infected a resident who is now fighting for his life. We don't want to see another human case of Triple E this year. The rare but dangerous disease can cause swelling in the brain. There's no treatment and anyone can get infected. The death rate is as high as 30%. Even if you do survive, um, usually there are long-term significant health impacts, neurological impacts. Oxford has been declared a critical risk for Tripoli, prompting health department officials to recommend a 6 p.m. curfew for outdoor activities, including club sports. These are recommendations. They're not hard and stop requirements. We are definitely nervous about it. Sarah Fournier is also worried her children's sports seasons, football and cheer could be jeopardized, but they're taking precautions by wearing mosquito repellent and long sleeve tops. Triple E symptoms usually begin between four to 10 days after being bitten by an infected mosquito. According to the CDC, now some of those symptoms can include fever, headache, and seizures. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. The urgent search underway in Germany right now for a suspect in that knife attack at a diversity festival. It is a difficult day here in Zoling, and that is the scene in the distance behind me. And uh, we are in the town square, and ordinarily people would be able to walk around here and enjoy this annual festival. But this morning, you can see the area is taped off, and overnight, police were in the midst of an urgent manhunt. This morning, German officials searching for a suspect in the deadly stabbing spree at a festival in the city of Zollingen. It happened around 9.30 Friday night. A man went on a rampage, attacking people at random with a knife. Police say he killed at least three people and seriously injuring multiple others. The festivities organizers taking to the stage, warning people to keep calm as special forces rush to secure the area. Authorities working to determine a motive and to find the suspect who they believe acted alone. The attack canceling the three-day festival of diversity, celebrating the city's 650th anniversary. The state's interior minister saying his thoughts and prayers are with the victims and their families, while Zolingen's mayor writing on Facebook, tears in my eyes when I think of those we have lost. I pray for all those who are still fighting for their lives. Right now, several people are still in the hospital uh, recovering. Meanwhile, investigators are here at the scene uh, continuing to process this area that, that goes on for several blocks here. And authorities had already been on high alert this summer over the risk of terror, but there has been no specific word on a motive for this attack. Breaking news overnight of a prisoner swap between Russia and Ukraine. 
Reuters is reporting the two countries are set to exchange 115 prisoners today following mediation from the United Arab Emirates. Meanwhile, the U.S. Defense Department has announced that the Biden administration is sending $125 million in new military aid to Ukraine as it marks its Independence Day today. The support comes after Ukraine's surprise incursion into Russia's Kursk region, opening up another front in the fighting and claiming to have captured an area of 500 square miles. U.S. officials say Ukrainian forces are starting to transition to holding the ground they've taken as Russia has reinforced its defenses. Ukraine's surprise attack into Russia caught Moscow off guard. More than two weeks on, vital supplies, troops and weapons stream into the territory around the clock. We are right on the border with Russia, and if the amount of military hardware is anything to go by, this offensive shows no sign of slowing down. Eyes in the sky capture the fierce fighting. Drones directing artillery to strike Russian positions and protect Ukrainian soldiers. Mm, Commander yeah, Vitaly, whose identity we were, were asked to conceal, helped to lead the charge into Kursk. He can't praise drones enough. Reconnaissance drones allow us to monitor the enemy's front line, he says. They also let us reduce the amount of ammunition we use and reduce the loss of our troops. The 117th Territorial Brigade runs drone missions into Kursk. Sergeant Alex leads this unit. How important is this drone in the fight against Russia? Very important. This system is far more effective and precise than artillery, he says. Private Igor is the pilot. If the target is static, it's pretty easy to hit, he says. If it's a moving target, then it's much harder. Private Victor drives the team to and from the front, arguably the most important job of all. When you're being chased by a drone, what goes through your mind? Nothing. Speed and professionalism are the most important, he says, adding they also hope the car doesn't break down. In this war, no one owns the sky. Are you guys winning the drone war? Yes, he says, but recently after the start of the Kursk operation, there are more enemy attack drones on our direction. The U.S. military package includes HIMARS ammunition, Javelin anti-armor weapons, artillery shells, and crucially, systems to counter Russia's drones. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict, and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. In other news, Israeli citizens could be facing a new danger from Hamas. This time the threat would be to Israelis outside the Jewish state. Israeli media report Hamas has decided to target Israelis abroad in its bid to avenge the killing of its top leader, Ismail Haniya, in Iran. That's because it apparently has little ability left to strike Israel directly from Gaza after the pounding it's taken over the last 10 months from the IDF. In the past, Hamas has largely failed at its attempts at such terror attacks overseas since its founding in 1987. In Israel, mourners are burying the bodies of six hostages recovered this week in Gaza. Yoram Metzger from Kibbutz Niroz, one of the hardest hit communities, and Yagev Bukhshtav from Kibbutz Nirim were laid to rest in their communities, which are still evacuated. Forensic experts say evidence shows all six were shot, and initial findings suggest their captors in Gaza murdered them, but the findings are just preliminary. We have no idea what you went through there. You do not deserve to end your life this way. In what world is a mother supposed to think that the nightmare will end when her son is returned for burial? In what world does a mother have to thank for the return of her son who was abandoned and murdered? Israel is keeping up its attacks on both Hamas and Hezbollah as it fights to defeat the terror groups backed by Iran. Israel launched extensive strikes against Hezbollah at different locations in southern Lebanon this week. 
In Gaza, the IDF says its troops killed some 50 terrorists in just one day in Rafah this week. It also lost a 19-year-old sergeant, the 336th Israeli soldier to die in the Gaza war. Israeli ambassador to the UN Danny Danone says all the bloodshed can end as soon as Hamas is defeated or surrenders. The future for Gaza will begin when Hamas will be eradicated. It's on the way. It's happening. Once Hamas will be eradicated, we can start speak about reconstruction and building a future for the people of Gaza. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness, for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. On the banks of the Madeira River in the Brazilian Amazon, boats are becoming stranded. Their movement impeded by sandbars, rocky outcrops and low water levels. Just a year on from Brazil's worst drought in history, it's a foreboding sign and fears are high that this year's dry season could be worse than the last. There are rocky corners where we pass really slow so that we can avoid the worst from happening. We have to protect our lives and the lives of our passengers. To make matters worse, vision is obstructed by the thick clouds of smoke that have also blanketed the nearby city of Porto Velho. The city has gone two months without significant rainfall and now residents are struggling to breathe after the region's worst period of wildfires in nearly two decades. According to data collected by Brazil's INPE Space Research Institute, the Amazon as a whole recorded more than 42,000 forest fires between January and August, 87% higher than the same period in 2023. On Tuesday, the country's environment minister issued a reminder that these events are linked to climate change and that world leaders need to limit global temperatures. We're already living with the effects of climate change, what's happening in the Amazon, too much drought, too much rain, and humanity paying a very high price. Scientists have warned that if Earth surpasses the established 1.5 degrees Celsius warming threshold, humanity will face more extreme and irreversible events such as increased and more frequent droughts and wildfires. Such as increased and more frequent droughts and wildfires. Actions that seem futile, given the scale of the disaster. The capital Niamey is submerged, transformed into a vast lake. The gendarmerie is hard at work, but it doesn't seem to be enough. We would like the government to provide us with more canoes, even though it has already sent two large gendarmerie patrol boats to make the crossing free of charge and in complete safety. We are really scared because once the dike gives way, the whole of the Mord would effectively be gone and many people could be left homeless. God alone can measure the consequences, but on a human scale, we can only estimate that there could be a risk of death, flooding and houses collapsing. These floods, which have affected several parts of the country, are leaving a heavy toll. Around 100 people have died, and more than 137,000 have been affected. Neighboring Chad has not been spared. The capital, Jamena, was hit by heavy rains. During the night of 17 to 18 of August, houses collapsed, leaving the population vulnerable. To date, the province of Tibesti has recorded more than 70 deaths, according to local authorities. The rainy season extends from June to September in the region. It was particularly deadly in Niger in 2022, with 195 deaths and 400,000 people affected. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7, and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Luke 12, 54-56 Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? Are you discerning the times? The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs 
on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.